Professor, Professor Joe uh, Jarvis is a literary scholar who writes and teaches across linguistics, linguistic and disciplinary borders. Since 2016, she has been an assistant professor in the Department of French at Yale University, where she's also a member of the Councils on African Studies and Middle East Studies. Her scholarship has been shaped by research in Algeria, but her interest in questions of state violence, translation, and justice have led her to investigate aesthetic and intellectual networks across the African Sahara. Her publications and research collaborations can contribute to multiple fields, Francophone, North African, and post-colonial and post literary studies and theory, histories of violence, decolonization, migration, and cultural memory, film and sound studies, and environmental humanities. Her first book, Decolonizing Memory, Algeria and the Politics of Testimony, was published by Duke uh, University Press in June 2021. This book charts a new itinerary for comparative literary studies and for studies of testimony, cultural memory, and decolonization in and beyond French. Uh, Professor Jarvis has just shared with me the great news that this book won the MLA Prize, the Scalion uh, uh, MLA Prize. Nobody knows, so... He's the first uh, to know. Uh, <laughs> so, congratulations. So, uh, it's the first time anyone has heard about it, so we're privileged. Um, during a residency at the Camargo Foundation in Cassis, France in 2019, she began to draft a new book called uh, Science in the Desert, an Aesthetic Cartography of the Sahara. In this book, she draws from the insights of spatial theory, critical cartography, and forensic architecture to build a case for how contemporary writers and filmmakers from across the African Sahara trans transform the reductive and dangerous ways in which this desert has, been, has long been mapped, an activity that she defines as aesthetic cartography. This work, this work has pushed her to rethink disciplinary boundaries uh, so she has created the research collective Desert Futures, Sahara uh, slash Sonora, along with colleagues Brahim El Guabli from Williams College and Francisco Robles from Notre Dame. This collaboration brings together scholars and artists to contribute to different fora and publications over the next several years, including the Desert Futures workshop and public symposium that she organized at Yale in uh, April 2022. Together, these scholars are working to create new pathways for interdisciplinary humanities scholarship through sustained comparative focus on the poetics and politics of two of the most contested and militarized border zones on Earth, the Sahara and the Sonora. Uh, the talk today is Radiant Matter, the Long Shadow of French Nuclear Imperialism in the Living Sahara. And please welcome me, please join me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Joe Jarvis today at UW. So thank you so much, um, I think, for that wonderful introduction. Also, it's just so exciting to actually be in person in a room with people again. Um, so Vlad, thank you for making that possible, and uh, Uni for helping to get me here and get me all set up, and to the Department of African Cultural Studies also for making this possible. I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to sort of dive right in. Um, I understand we have an hour together, and so I want to leave a little time to, to talk. But the matter I'm gonna be talking about today Radiant Matter is really emerged directly from the seams of this book. So I'm not talking about this book, but what happened after, um, once I sort of finished this. Um, so in this book, Decolonizing Mem Memory, I make a case for the anarchival capacity of literary works to register the enduring afterlife of the catastrophic legal violence that was exercised by the French to colonize and occupy Algeria. And so Radiant Matter, this work, um, comes from the book that you just heard about that I'm writing about the ways in which transmedial aesthetic works help to counter the colonial legacies that live on in the ways that we have been trained to think or really not to think about desert places. In particular, my interest is the African Sahara. All right, so you heard a bit about the Desert Futures Collective. The work that I'm doing is in uh, sort of community and collaboration with a series of other people in this collective that we formed. And here is the conference we finally could hold last 2022, April 2022. It was supposed to happen in 2020, but there we are just a few months ago. Um, and actually, there I am with my colleagues whose work you'll hear about as I talk. Um, and so, so we're connected by this interest in pushing back on the deadly but still very useful colonizing idea that deserts are empty, and of course they are not empty. Here's a volume edited by my friend and colleague Samia Henny that just came out this week, um, so you can kind of get a sense of the work that she's doing and we're doing together. So I'll dive right in. 
Um, these images, I don't know if you saw them, they circulated through the news and across like Twitter feeds about a year and a half ago in February 2021, showing this eerie red dust that was falling on the snow in the mountains of France and Switzerland. So it, it turns the sky red, it got on people's car windshields, it made the snow look funny. And it turns out that this blew in from the Sahara Right, as the Saharan dust does, it circulates about the planet, um, but it was also radioactive, as you can see in the headline there. It contained trace um, residue of cesium-137. Right, And the article and all the discourse in Europe about this was that you know, it's, it's not dangerous, it's just this trace from, you know, from the past. And I'm guessing you have some sense of why this dust was radioactive, given the title of my talk. Right? Um, because starting in 1960, near the end of Algeria's long war to end 130 years of French colonial occupation, the French military carried out 17 nuclear bomb detonations in what is now the Algerian Sahara. All right, so I'm going to swiftly orient you to ground zero in the Algerian desert, as it were, where the French military built actually three different bases. This is the first one, Bay de Namus, which was constructed by the French in the 1930s, not publicly revealed until the 90s. That was a chemical sort of experimentation site chemical weapons. Then further south near Rigan um, was the site of four aerial bomb detonations between 1960 and 61. Each one of those bombs, there's the first, um, was named for this cute little desert rodent called a gerboise. Right? So gerboise bleu, and what a, the, the military poetry of these names for bombs is really something. <laughs> right, so gerboise bleu, blanche, rouge, then verte, the colors of the French and then Algerian national flags. There's an actual gerboise. I really feel sorry for the gerboise that their name is on that. Um, gerboa. In 1961, the French moved the nuclear bombings further south and quite literally and very deliberately underground, um, directly inspired by what the US government was doing to southern Paiute and western Shoshone land um, starting in 1957. The French detonated 13 nuclear bombs underground inside this mountain that you see in this map. Um, the mountain's name is Taurit Tenafela. I will talk a lot about this mountain today. Um, so these bombs, right, the, the four plus the 13, these 17 bombs, were the first of 210 French nuclear bomb detonations in total. The others were exploded on colonized islands in the South Pacific. As you can see on this larger nuclear map, the green dots are the French bombs. My concern today are the bombs on the African continent, specifically the ones underground, specifically one of them. Right, so each of the 13 underground bombs, as you can see here, was named for a different precious stone, like these glittering jewels in the crown of French empire. Um, so agate, beryl, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, And then you can see that there were five simulations of plutonium accidents conducted at a nearby mountain named with this sort of whimsical pollen um, belying the, the toxic spread that, that followed. All right, so after 1966, right, the French transferred control of these irradiated sites to the new Algerian government, which had formed in 1962 with independence, and the French then moved on to bombing the islands in the southern Pacific on these atolls that you see here. And before that happened, right, before they abandoned the Saharan sites to Algerian control, the French military disposed of all of this. So you see photographs of this actually happening, these, these anonymous photographs from this 2022 report, disposed of irradiated airplanes, helicopters, trucks, sand, radioactive rocks, the barrels that had transported plutonium pellets, <coughs> all of this radioactive matter. Um, they ordered French soldiers and Algerian workers to literally bury it in the sand and record it in all of the French military logbooks as just like buried in the sand, lost. So the deranged principle there is that the, the Sahara would just absorb this radioactive matter, which was also the idea about oceans um, in the 1950s and 60s. But those burial sites are still out there. Locations unknown, you see it happening here. And in fact, there are maps of those burial sites locked in the French military's hoarded defense archives and a point of dispute between the French and Algerian governments right now. And so access to those maps is actually one of the demands issued by this report that you see here from 2020. All right, so the sites near Regan and Ein Eker, which is the area where that mountain, Taurit Tanafela, is, these sites were selected for their alleged remoteness and emptiness. Right? According to the French state and the people making these decisions, this was for the purpose of safety, cleanliness, and containment. But of course, the Sahara is anything but empty. And of course, the bombs were anything but safe, clean, or contained. Right? So right now, 
The effects of those detonations and pollinations continue to radiate both temporally and spatially, traveling by way of people's footsteps, wind patterns, water aquifers, cells, DNA, bones, soil, marketplaces, people like pick up the material and go sell it in the marketplaces to be repurposed, and in the dust that you saw wafting into Europe last year. Right, so French nuclear imperialism is not a past problem. It's not contained to the 1960s. It is a present problem and a future one, right? The sand itself has been forever altered by colonial occupation. So this radiant matter is quite literally an indelible and radiating archive. And if you just, just to get a feel for the time scale of the problem, you can consider that the half-life of the plutonium isotope used to build those bombs is 24,100 years right, for the half-life decay. All right, so my use of the term radiant in the title, um, this talk is actually about to be an article uh, in representation, so you can, you can go find it. Um, radiant amplifies the point made by the historian, nuclear historian Gabriel Hecht, um, that the French word rayonnement in the widely circulated post World War II phrase, le uh, rayonnement en France, like the radiance of France, conveys both a sense of enlightenment grandeur and of nuclear radiation. So, this imperial radiance that France pollinated the desert with, right, has left an enduring radiological and epistemological legacy whose effects really have not been fully measured or studied. Which is not for lack of effort by scholars. You can see some of the work that's been done here. And these are the colleagues in the Desert Futures Collective, Sami Aheni and Roxanne Panchesi um, and others, right? And also not for lack of effort by activists. There are collections of soldier testimonies. There are documentary films being made by Algerians. There are also a number of activist organizations. Right, so people are trying to, to make this known. Um, and the, the sort of dead zone about this knowledge is also not just because militarized radiation is phenomenologically difficult to perceive, right, but it is a, a fundamentally invisible problem <coughs> in some ways. Right, but these 17 bombs were created and detonated as French state secrets with the complicity of the new Algerian government in formation. Their violence was not accidental nor incidental, and nor is it finished unfolding whether by design or neglect, the energetic traces of France's first 17 nuclear bombs are right now radiating within and beyond the living Sahara, despite being persistently disappeared from collective memory. And I'm curious, before coming today, had you studied or learned about these bombs? I'm getting a lot of no's, and that is always what happens, right, when I talk about this, and that's what happened for me. I really, I've learned about these in the middle of writing that other book. It's like, why on earth am I a specialist of Algeria and decolonization? I don't know about this. All right, so that nuclear non-knowing, I think, is really important to think about. Um, so French nuclear bombing in the Sahara confronts us with this historiographic dead zone that you all just, you know, acknowledged. Right, and at that dead zone is sort of scrambled critical radars for the decades since Algerian independence. Algeria is the only state the colonized state to have gained independence during the process of nuclear bombing by a colonial power, right? So the bombs detonated after 1962 were authorized by clauses written into the Evian Accords that negotiated Algeria's independence from France on the condition that the French military would maintain control of its nuclear and chemical weapons sites and also extraction sites in the Sahara for five years after the transfer of sovereignty in 1962, which has helped to create a legal and historical terra incognita that the particular bomb at the center of my talk today really helps to bring into focus. Um, if you look into the French military archives, you get maps like this that are so incredibly blurry, mm -hmm. they're impossible to read, which is just such a great metaphor <laughs> for the whole problem of looking at the, into the French defense archives. Right, but so the bomb I'm gonna talk about, Beryl, Beryl, burst out of its subterranean chamber inside that mountain on May 1st, 1962, which is a few months after the peace agreements and ceasefire in Algeria and a few months before Algerian independence, right? So this sort of no man's land, of like where are we juridically in terms of sovereignty? And it spewed this toxic cloud that irradiated and eventually killed not only French soldiers and ministers at the observation site, but also Algerian workers and the residents of a nearby village called Mertutek whose residents continue to live right now with the enduring impact, not just of that bomb, right, but of all of these bombs. And you can see that's a you know, nomadic tent right next to the mountain a month after the, the barrel incident. Right? So of course there are people there. 
right? And the soldiers, that's a hand-drawn map by a soldier introducing other soldiers to the site, and they're like, there's Mertu Tech right over there. It's not like there's no one there, people didn't know. So Beryl's botched detonation, and this is like footage from the observation <coughs> site, it is a military documentation. It's often referred to as the Beryl incident, or as the worst nuclear accident in French history, as if this outcome was negligible, unpredictable, or exceptional. Right, but to those whose bodies actually bear the cost of nuclear imperial violence, I don't think it matters that the French or the US right, call these kinds of bombs experiments or tests, which is why you might have noticed I don't use the word test, because they're bombs. Right? And if you extend the temporal scale, the damage is just the same. Right? So, so barrel is not an aberration or an accident but a metonym for the broader operations of French nuclear imperialism. Secreted underground, radically uncontained in both space and time, distorted by the very archives imagined to hold key evidence about its happening, inassimilable to state-centered chronologies of decolonization, and unaccountable to existing legal frameworks for any kind of redress. Right? So it shouldn't be surprising to you although it is revelatory and disturbing to learn that of the 1,476 applications for indemnity that have been filed through 20, this is outdated, but through 2020, under a French law of 2010 to um, you know, pay victims of irradiation from these bombs, only one of those claims has been paid to an Algerian. Right? The rest are largely um, French veterans who had been stationed there. Right, so, I am interested in this talk and in this work in the potential of aesthetic works, transmedial aesthetic works that I'll show you, um, to help us apprehend and address the slow violence of French nuclear imperialism that continues right now to target desert landscapes and lives for destruction. Right, so the strict laws and selective declassifications that govern access to French military archives really reflect the, states, the French state's ongoing interest in controlling the visual narrative and legal frameworks concerning its nuclear weapons. Right. And until recently, very strict archival interdictions have helped to ghost pretty much all but the faintest traces of these bombs from both professional historiography and public knowledge. That's starting to change, but just, just. Right, so at present, uh, scholars that I sort of flashed their names already, um, Roxanne Panchesi, the architectural historian, Samia Henny, are working on projects to help correct this disconnect, and I am working alongside them as a literary scholar and a sort of cultural artifacts scholar. Um, and I find that the plain fact that knowledge about these bombs, these French bombs on the African continent, is so glitchy and elusive, right, as we're all sort of experiencing. Um, this nuclear non-knowing attests the enduring narrative power of the French state's dubious cartographical claims that were being art articulated very emphatically by this guy, Jules Moke, at the UN in 1959, defending the decision to drop, to, to detonate the bombs. Right, his argument at the UN, you can see all the skeptical and hostile <laughs> alliances of objectors led by um, Ben Taima of Morocco, right? They were like, what are you doing? This is insane. And his argument was that this part of the Sahara was once, at once, empty, there's no one there. Um, is legally French, because we're talking about like the, the French delusion that Algeria is France in 1959, and also intrinsically detached from the rest of Algeria and Africa. It's like this, the Sahara is this other thing. Right. So I use the frame, the frame, the term nuclear imperialism to sort of push against all of those ideas, right, and to counter the French state's ongoing disavowal by insisting that nuclearism is imperialism. It is a phrase that we inherit from activists who organized, as you see in this photograph, across, this is in Accra in 1960, right? Um, who organized across and beyond the continent in the 60s, or the 50s and the 60s, to denounce and, and oppose French nuclear imperialism on the grounds that it was state-sponsored white supremacist terror wreaked on African lives and land. And you can see, stop the nuclear nonsense, no nuclear imperialism, stop it, France, <laughs> on these sides. So as it stands, aesthetic works, you know, photography, film, poetry, narrative, song, sculpture, might be the best instruments we have to register the toxic radiance of French nuclear imperialism in the Sahara. And so the transmedial works that I'm going to discuss here are flexible, open-ended instruments that train senses to perceive the multi-temporal and multi-scalar materiality of nuclear radiance. 
And also, I think they help train our imaginations to raise questions of justice beyond state-centered frameworks and also beyond narrowly human bounds. Right, so every one of the 2,000 plus nuclear bombs detonated on our planet since 1945 is still exploding right, in a radiological sense. They will continue to do so for the unimaginable future. So the long shadow of nuclear imperial violence itself fundamentally troubles time in the sense articulated by Karen Barad. Right, the cascading energy chain that is set in motion when the nucleus of an atom is split both obliterates material boundaries and, in her words, elongates, disperses, and exponentially frays time's coherence. French nuclear imperialism is what Rob Nixon calls slow violence. Right? It happens out of sight, off the usual maps, beyond spectacular visual frames. It radiates unpredictably and unevenly in both spatial and temporal terms, incremental, accretive, its calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of temporal scales. The last part was Rob Nixon, not me. So I'm going to share with you two works that lucidly chart the way that barrels, that bomb, um, barrels' largely invisible impact still radiates through material and cultural ecosystems in and beyond the marginalized Algerian South and across a range of temporal scales. Right, so in the time we have, I'm going to focus closely on one piece, this first one, and then give you a sense of the second. If you really want to hear me nerd out about this, you can read the article. <laughs> I'm happy to send it to you. Um, so the first piece is a multimedia installation by um, the Algiers-based photojournalist Amar Borras. He created it between 2012 and 2017 when it was shown in Algiers. It's called 24 degrees, 3 minutes, 50 five seconds north, five degrees, three minutes, 23 seconds east. That is the geolocation coordinate of Beryl's detonation point inside the mountain Tawarit Tenafela. Right. So, and, it, and you can see here, it, it's a series of photographs and also um, uh, video and sculpture, glass sculpture, and a series of short texts that he just sort of got Algerian writers to produce. Right. So it's this whole constellation of works. And he redid it in a smaller version, actually, just this last summer in Berlin. This is at the Berlin Biennale in 2022. Um, so it continues to evolve and change. The second piece is Elizabeth Lovray's film, Atom, from 2013, a documentary film. It's about like 50 minutes long, based on landscape photographs and portraits taking, taken by Bruno Aji between 2000, 2009 and 2012. Right. And that film was actually screened in the U.S. for the first time at the Desert Futures Conference I told you about that happened a few months ago. Um, there we are watching it with Elizabeth Livray, Samia Henney, um, Roxanne Panchesi. That's really bad, they said. <laughs> All right. So in what follows, I'm going to unfold the ways in which Boras and Livray repurpose militarized technologies of light and activate senses other than sight in ways that help to reanimate the supposedly desert land and also attune senses to the invisible materiality of a past that is so very, very present. Right, so if taken seriously as sources, primary sources, for creating, protecting, and transmitting knowledge, I think that works like these can really help to loosen the stubborn grip that nation states still hold over deciding what matters become history at all. Right, so to take these works seriously means looking and listening and thinking in terms of temporal processes that confound and elude the distorting amnesiac frames that nation states so readily provide. It also means unlearning this weird fetish that a lot of people have with the hoarded defense archives in order to look elsewhere, right? And to collectively create ways to better perceive the radiant matter that really is already everywhere, like so many lively atoms hiding in plain sight. So this piece, the, the first piece um, by Amar Borras. He was scared of the radioactivity on the site and also of the Algerian authorities with good reason because he hadn't got permission to take images here. So he started the project by driving along the Trans-Saharan Highway that you see that runs right alongside the mountain, right? This like, radioactive mountain is right beside the highway if you drive south. Um, and so he started by creating this five minute video which was eventually shown along with the, the rest of the exhibition. And you can see this is a screenshot of a video. So he's like zipping past it on the highway, scared to get out. Um, and you've got facing frames, this sort of nondescript blur, but you can see there's a barrier, right? There's some barbed wire, and there are these frames these, that either have 
this word zone, and then sometimes in Arabic, mutaka. And if you look closer, you can see there's a word that's been removed from all of the signs. Mm -hmm. right? There's this like, trace of something. So Bogas explains that the warning panels were first put up, there's like 270 of them all around the mountain with this barbed wire, like going to contain the radioactivity. <laughs> um, put up by the Algerian government in the 1990s, labeling it a zone interdite, right, a forbidden zone, or a mentaka muhammara. Um, and by 2012, Algerian entrepreneurs running gleaning operations with their trucks and workers had actually scraped off the interdite so that their workers wouldn't get alarmed by what they were being exposed to. And they were going in there to pick over the material and take scrap metal back to the markets to sell in Tamar Rasset. Right. This is, Amar Burhas just told me this. I don't have any other documentation of that point, but that's what he said happened. Right, so Burhas's video and photographs of those defaced warning signs actually activate or are haunted, rather, by photographs taken by French soldiers on the same location decades earlier. So Burhas includes these photographs, which he found, and I tr found them too, um, posted anonym anonymously in these online forums for French military veterans, where they exchange like, experiences about what happened. Right, so that's where these pictures come from. So some soldier, who's ne probably dead now, <laughs> um, took these and posted them in like 20, 000, 2008 on this forum. Um, and these photographs, unsigned, right, depict these signs erected along with barbed wire around Taurit Tanafella during the 1960s, and they read, as you can see, you who pass by, pass without seeing me, and you who leave, forget me. There's a different photograph up in the top left there, not mentioned by Burras, which was also taken surreptitiously by a former soldier from a vehicle. Um, it, so, it shows this official sign put up by the military saying, uh, forbidding, prise de vue, for, forbidding photographs, right? So Burras's image of the zone Mintaka sign that now encircles the once restricted bomb site indexed this recessed archive of clandestine soldier photographs. Right, so the sign forbidding photographs here conveys the French state's military interest not in protecting bodies from harm, but in controlling the visibility and secrecy of its bombs. So Borras's photographs of the yellow and red signs around this zone, formerly forbidden, so similar in color and implied sense to these other enigmatic signs imploring forget me and pass here without seeing me, likewise convey the Algerian state's interest in monitoring visibility, not in protecting Algerians. Right, so this likeness surfaces that silently connects the French and Algerian militaries as allies in obfuscating the violence done here at and to Tawarit Tanafella. Right, so in contrast to that blurred video shot that, I, that he started with, um, the, the photographs, there are now 24 of them, the photographs and panoramas that are part of the numbered series of Bourras's installation are framed from the perspective of a person with his feet on the ground. Right? He gets out of the car and starts walking around the site for days. Like he, spent, he said he just spent days and nights there because he felt a sense of sorrow and pain from the mountain and he wanted to get, the, get to know the mountain better. Right? So he gets out, he's walking around this radioactive place. Right? And also shifting between uh, media forms, right? So he's taking photographs, but you can also, and then he starts to make these glass sculptures to respond to the site, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, and creates, right, um, also these collages that you can see here, um, and maps like this one, right? So the photographs feature the mountain viewed from various distances and changing light. Many of them have the mountain partially obscured by tangled piles of metallic waste or by dust. And you can see right here, this is a, uh, like a, a, an aerial map made up of individual photographs of radioactive debris. Right? So together, these images prompt awareness that this landscape, this mountain, is constituted by commingling temporalities. Also attunes us to the radiant processes unfolding over many different time scales. So the 24 photographs create a sense of the photographer himself sort of shuttling around, moving around. They register the passage of time of his footsteps over land. Um, and some of them, like this one, right, given that ultra high speed photography is itself a technological byproduct of nuclear bombing, this slow shutter technique used here, I find especially striking for the way that it frames the mountain's complex multi-temporal materiality. So I wanna to talk to you about this photograph. Right, so, so I just said, um, Ultra-fast photography is a byproduct of nuclear bombing. 
Right, so optical technologies were designed and calibrated in order to capture the infinitesimal first instances of nuclear bomb blast. Right, so photographs of detonating bombs, you've all seen them, they're, in, they're burned into your memories, right, have had the effect of visually containing and controlling the sublime spectacle of nuclear state power. Right, so by contrast, the slow shutter technique here dramatically increases exposure to make visible light's movement over a much longer period. Right? So you can see it's an exposure of at least several minutes, the streaks of the, the truck passing by and the star trails in the sky, right? register times passing. And this slow shutter technique, I think, makes perceptible the macro historical nuclear shadows that the micro temporal frame of militarized photographs of nuclear bombing are designed to facilitate not seeing or thinking about. Right, so here I've juxtaposed Boras's photograph, Ein Ecker number 21, with a screen capture from that archival military footage that you, you saw earlier um, of Beryl's botched detonation. Right, so both images capture the mountain from the same angle. Right? So Boras's photograph is a bit more distant, but you can see the distinctive outline of the, the mountain there, which invites us to kind of superimpose the 1962 scene into the, the present image. Right, and the black shadow of that renegade nuclear cloud erupting is visually echoed by the illuminated bramble of barbed wire in the foreground here. Right, barbed wire that was, like those warning signs, put up by the French, then reinforced by the Algerian governments as a gesture of containing a totally uncontainable bomb and a material reminder of that still unfolding radiological shadow. Right, that cloud is in some sense still unfolding and permeating and animating the landscape. Right, and continuing that blast. So <clears throat> military technologies of light, ultra-fast photography, ultra-slow motion video, satellite imaging, none of these are neutral data collectors, but in fact powerful rhetorical and political instruments. Right, so the Rapatronic camera that was designed to photograph nuclear blasts on the Mojave Desert in the 1950s, for instance, was built to capture light exposure of less than one half of one millionth of a second, and its shutter was actually calibrated to the detonation mechanism of the bomb. So the resulting photographs that you've surely seen um, have been circulated in ways that sustain the impression of an omnipotent national security state in technological control of nuclear spectacle, and Boras's photograph, I think, undoes this illusory optics to unfold a multiplicity of converging temporalities right, in this single slow exposure that brings the long, incredibly long durée of nuclear harm into the frame. Right, so we see the mountain, the black shadow of this sharp granite profile against the night sky, which is illuminated by a kind of limb of, of, of light. Um, and you see the, the light passing through, but our eye, and you also see the, the star trails in the sky. So our eyes are at first drawn to what is illuminated. In the dark sky, these luminous star trails are the effect of the slow, slow shutter exposure rendering visible the Earth's slow rotation. These are also a vision of the deep galactic past, right, given that light travels from light years distant stars to reach our eyes. But this landscape photograph not only creates a visual archive of the enduring presence of the nuclear bomb's nearly instantaneous flash, it is also a temporal relief map that layers together microtemporal with macrotemporal radiant processes that coalesce around the dark outline of that granite mountain. Right, so the absence of light at the center of the photograph seems to repel visibility. The dark mountain here connects visually to a series of other shadows across our nuclearized planet. Specifically, it recalls these area photographs taken by the US military of islands in the Pacific um, after hydrothermal bomb detonations there obliterated islands that had existed. Right, so you see the weapon Mike um, on the left blew that island, El Galeb, out of existence, leaving this sort of dark shadow of an anti-island. This photograph shows the sort of anti-island created by the 15 megaton bomb Bravo um, in the Bikini Atoll in 1953, which is often referred to as the worst radiological disaster in history. So these dark craters where once were living islands, much like the darkened anti-mountain in Boras's photograph, appear as blank spots, something to pass without seeing nuclear shadows designed to be forgotten. And here, Boras's shift of medium from photograph to glass sculpture makes vivid and luminous this dark site of unspeakable desecration. 
Right? Glass is an unsettled dynamic state of matter that is formed when molten material like sand cools after being superheated, and it too is a material byproduct of nuclear detonation on deserts. You can think of Trinitite, the, the glass shards littered across the Nevada desert after um, the Trinity bomb there in 1945. All right, so the nine glass volumes that Borras sculpted are distinctively shaped, they're brilliantly colored, they look like gems, which reminds us of those deceptively beautiful names that the French gave to their bombs. And in fact, these two look like the mineral structure of beryl, the mineral, which is found inside the veins of igneous and metamorphic rock when hydrothermal activity alters geology over time. So they are like these otherworldly fossils extracted from the granite mountains deep strata, like these sculptures that reflect the way that, as Juicy Parika has put this, nuclear violence transforms metals, minerals, and the earth in the most concrete ways. Bourras's nine luminous sculptures exude energy that attracts different modes of engagement than do landscape photographs or video. Right? It's hard not to want to touch them and to like pick them up and pass them along. And he says, you know, he, he thought of gems in this precious sort of sense that you hold them like these delicate, precious things to pass through generations. And you can see him here kindly on Zoom showing them to me. You can see my greedy little eyes. I, really, <laughs> I just really want so badly to go to Algiers and buy one of these from him and bring it home. Mm -hmm. um, he showed them to me happily. But which is to say the alluring three-dimensional Volume en verre, these glass volumes, invite tactile experience and create potential contact points for Tauri Titana Fella's radiant matter to interact and commingle with living bodies in unpredictable ways. I'm going to, I think I have about 10 minutes, so I'm going to give you a sense of the other piece and then open to questions. Does that seem okay? We stop right at one. So, okay. Sure, but it's up if 10 minutes, fine. But. Yeah, people finish sometimes. So I'm or to it's <laughs> dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. I'd love to. I'd love to talk with you. So I'm going to move more swiftly over this part, but give you a visual sense of um, Elizabeth Lavray's film *At Home*, which is this again. These totally awkward titles, both of them. This one's a wordplay. It sounds either in English like *At Home*, right, or *Atom* in French *At Home*. But that invokes that insane cartographical logic that the French were articulating that we are legally at home here in Algeria and therefore bombing the desert is perfectly fine. Right, and this, her film is incredible. I, if you'd like to watch it, I'll, you write to me and I'll, I'll make sure you can get to it. Um, it combines landscape photographs with archival um, uh, sort of sonic and visual images to create this reflection on what happened um, in the wake of the barrel bomb. Right, and it moves sort of in four, par uh, sort of four parts across different landscapes in Algeria, and it goes to the town Mertutek and then to Algiers at the end. So I wanted to just give you a glimpse of Mertutek, right? The photographs are layered with sonic tracks that actually, you actually listen to people speaking about their experiences living in that town in 1962 when the bomb came over them. Right. And we also hear soundtrack from Jules Mok making his arguments at the UN that the Sahara is totally empty. Of course, we are, you know, should bomb there. There's no one there. And at the same time, watching the film, you're seeing photographs and listening to voices that just like that juxtaposition makes obvious just how violent those claims were. Right. And then we hear all of these voices speaking. And I'm actually going to just briefly play one for you and make a few comments about it before transitioning to conclusion. Um, let me see if. Actually, we didn't test the sound, so I'm not sure if this is going to work. It does. <laughs> She's coming. <laughs> Okay. You know, this person speaking was a child at Mertutek when the bomb passed over. Mm -hmm. And her memory, she's speaking in Tamashek, and you might not understand the words, but you can hear the sense of rhythm, you can hear the artistry of the story that she has told many times. and. 
in the acoustical arrangement, you hear this onomatopoeia, this, 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 spoken by this woman, imitating the sound of the bomb that she's still living with, right? Um, and it reverberates in the soundtrack. And, you know, sonic experience is inherently haptic, so it actually sort of touches and resonates um, for, for a listener or for a watcher, right? So in this transference, right, energy sort of moves over time and space to tremble even here and now as we hear it. Right? Undermining the kind of abstracted distance that you get from those, those maps and the arguments that Jules Mok is making, right? And generate in place of that an embodied experience of French nuclear imperialism that continues to radiate and to resonate here and now. Right, I'm going to show you one more image and then I'm going to end. So we'll still have just about 15 minutes for questions. Which the itineraries of these two pieces cross in Algiers. Right? Um, and I wanted to end with this photograph taken by Bruno Aji. This is part of Elizabeth Lefray's film. It's this black and white photograph, a close-up shot of weathered human hands holding these glittering, beautiful metallic stones, right? And it's almost like the, the two surfaces are blending, mm -hmm. as if the metallic sheen is rubbing off on these hands, or the hands themselves are becoming mineral. And from this part of Lefray's film, and this is the only place I've actually heard this articulated in any sort of substantial way, um, we learn about the history of how, what are these stones and what are they doing in Algiers. Um, between 1992 and 95, the film teaches us, the Algerian government arrested and detained thousands of people during what's called La Décinie Noire, right? um, and detained more than 25,000 men in these secret prisons in the desert that were actually built by repurposing the radioactive military barracks and military bomb sites that the French had left, right? So those, that imperial debris was reused as prisons during the 1990s. And so, you know, 25,000 men were secretly detained and disappeared there. Some of them came back. And some of them interviewed at the end of this film are saying, yeah, it was like this totally desiccated landscape. There we are, there's nothing living. The, the water is crackling and strange, and yet there are these beautiful stones outside the prison all around the ground, and we picked them up because they were beautiful. And we brought them home to our families, you know, as these souvenirs from prison, and then found out that they are radioactive. I mean, they are that radiant matter created by nuclear bomb blast, right? So they've brought them home and irradiated their families, right? And that's where the film ends. They say, there's a voice speaking and says, now there's a bit of this poison everywhere in Algeria, right? And so the presence of these radioactive minerals cupped in a man's hands in Algiers in this photograph suggests that many people, untold number, have already touched and ingested this radiant history, whether or not they know it, right? And the, the film prompts this profoundly unsettling question at the end, right? Just how many lives, human and non-human, are now unfolding with the shadow of these bombs in their cells and tissues? Right, and for how many generations? So, it is a truth of our time, and I'll end with a few soapbox words, I guess. Mm -hmm. It is a truth of our time that the radioactive isotopes of carbon, cesium, strontium, plutonium from the thousands of thermonuclear and atomic bombs, including barrel, that have been detonated inside our planet's deserts, mountains and islands over the last eight decades now permeate the bones of every human on Earth, right? Forensic scientists can actually date human remains by the carbon in our in teeth, right, to, to mark post-1945, right? And it is also true that states militarize and weaponize nuclear radiance in racialized ways, ensuring that some bodies receive more of this poison than do others, right? And evidence of this is already everywhere in and beyond Algeria. Right. It's not just out there in something that we could imagine to be a remote desert, but also very close to or even inside our own homes and bodies. Right. So there is no getting free of the event of nuclear catastrophe. It has already happened. It will not stop happening. We live in a world that is materially haunted on a cellular and atomic level by its continued unfolding. Granite mountains, water molecules, particles of sand are its witnesses. Our very bones and teeth or its archive, and I think that we need aesthetic works like these ones and others to help us recognize that we are quite literally marked and infused by the slow violence of nuclear imperialisms that we have been trained not to perceive. Right. So by transmitting energy in the ways that they do, at home and 24 degrees, help us to understand 
that this shadowed terrain is not and never was deserted, right? that it is a living landscape to which all of our bodies already belong. And I will close with a kind of benediction. <laughs> So thank you very much for being such an attentive audience. And I know I have so much to say about that topic, but I'm happy we've got 13 minutes left together. So I'm happy to, to talk about any part of that um, yeah. and answer questions. Yes? Um, yeah, I guess I have a question about um, whether you think that imperialism or colonialism is really um, necessary to your story. I view it as almost orthogonal, um, you know, you know, counterfactual, right? And so. The fact that France didn't, you know, have legal, you know, in a moral sense or ownership of the land, that seems irrelevant to me in a way, because I don't think that you would be telling a happier story if they did, or if it was the Algerian government that had decided to pursue nuclear weapons, where would they test them? Probably in, 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 in the same place. Or a different counterfactual, you know, imagine that France would you know, deeply wanted the bomb and obviously has to, to test it. You imagine a market transaction, right? And so they would um, bargain with a poor country for the right to, to, to bomb. And so I think, I guess I'm just, if you play around taking imperialism and colonialism out of the picture, does that change the, the, the message of your talk? I think it doesn't. I'm not sure what you mean by taking it out of the picture, actually. Um, because the, the, the very premise that any land is empty on which to detonate bombs is a colonial idea. I mean, here in the U.S., it's occupied land in a settler colony that the like the U.S. tested bombs and same. So I, I just I don't know how to take it out actually. And in the very context in Algeria, right? There's it's a it is a in the middle of a decolonizing war, right? A liberation war for independence that this is able to happen, and the French develop their nuclear program and plans both for weapons and for nuclear energy as a solution to decolonization and losing empire, right? So it just transformed its sort of plans for empire into joining the nuclear powers, which I think is an imperial project. So I, don't, I actually don't know how to take colonialism or imperialism out of the story, but I, I thank you. <laughs> Usually I moderate, but I'll, I'll, mm. I'll let you. I'll let you pick because then you don't know anybody, and then you know. Oh yeah, I don't know people's no names. I'd love to know the, names from the moderator. Like I'm picking my colleagues. I'm just walking like, blind. So I'll, you, please, Joe, just uh, whoever's. Yeah, I, I think I saw. Uh -huh. And yes. I'd, I'd love to hear your names actually too. But maybe that'll help. I'm Jason Yaki. I teach at the law school. Okay, it's great. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, and problem. the legal questions around decolonization and what happened here are also really important to the story. So. Yeah. Okay. I'm Leah, I'm a PhD student mm -hmm. in French, so. Okay. But I, I wanted to say that I actually don't agree with you because okay. when I <laughs> yes, for debate, right? Yeah, right? yeah, we don't have to agree, it's great. <laughs> but when I was listening to your presentation, which was so interesting, I can totally see how uh, the nuclear imperial violence is, is, is part of this, and I think that that's part of the structures we live in today. I mean, we see we're haunted by imperial violence by this country is haunted by slavery, for example. I think uh, Latin America, Africa, all of these continents still have traces of that. And I was really putting what you were talking about into the context of today, this threat of nuclear war now between Russia and the United States and how that nuclear state power is still really prevalent in our society and how they're trying to, what you said, contain the uncontainable. I mean, even through I, just that idea that this is something that's bigger than we are, and that it's it's hard to contain. So I mean, what I'm trying to say is, I can see I can see how this is this is an, this is inherently part of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm really interested. I mean, I, and you could see where I'm coming from on this. Very staunchly believe that we live in a world that is materially haunted, or composed of imperial debris, and there's no getting away from that. Like the the very material with which we breathe and eat and live, has been shaped and toxified by colonial violence in various ways. And I think this is what I'm sort of amplifying here. And just one side point, like the even more invisibilized side of what I call nuclear imperialism is uranium extraction, which is required for, for bombs and for nuclear energy. And where are, like, France has gotten like 80% of its uranium for decades from Niger, from 
mines in the desert, right? That can be sort of erased from uh, consideration of what nuclear energy even means, right? So that's, I'm, I'm interested in what brings those things to the fore and makes us actually see and recognize the way in which those imperial processes are still operating right now. Thank you. I should talk less and hear more questions. Yes. <laughs> um, I need to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I need trip um, political science. Um, so I heard about this this whole phenomenon mm -hmm. when I was in Algeria from educated people, but I'm curious, um, and I was always going to look into it, so I'm very glad that you came and educated us about this. Um, but uh, And I was never sure if it was really true or not, because it's kind of fed into a lot of the anti-French sentiment mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. also these days there. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm curious, how, what is the general population? Did you get a sense of how people themselves today you know, remember, the, not just in the, that affected area, but more generally, are people aware of this? And mm -hmm. how, how widespread is that knowledge? That is a really good question to which I would like to get a better answer. I've been unable to get visas to Algeria for a number of years to really talk with people, which is an important part of what I want to do here. But just from talking with even the photographer and the, the filmmaker who made these works, like the two of them, three I mentioned, are Algerians. And they like talk about having heard of the bombs as part of the anti-colonial, like it happened during the war, but it's sort of back then, back when, and we don't know much more about it. And then they discover, like they go on these trips to start looking into the details, and they sort of discover just how much impact it's still having. So I think there's some generalized awareness. Yes, there were bombs. France is terrible. But the thing is, because of the legal, the sort of complicity of the, the newly formed Algerian government in agreeing to let France have these bombs, there's also a lot of taboo around really digging into the history of how did that happen mm -hmm. and why. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it's really mixed. And the, the filmmaker and these, the artist, like they are showing these works in Algeria precisely in order to have people engage with and think through the history. Um, so I think. I think people generally know that it happened, unlike, say, here, or even in France. Like people in France, like, wait, what, in the desert, really? Um, people generally know, but they don't know the details. And when it comes to the Algerian government's role and the, those secret prisons that I mentioned, that stuff is really sort of um, taboo to talk about in a public way, is my sense. <laughs> Am I, did I see something over here that... And then, and then I spend the day with you, so far. Okay. Like, I'll pull that up. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. It's an interesting presentation. I'm on Booker Mohammed from the African Central States. And my question is um, regarding the uh, nuclear radioactivity and so on. Uh, in Africa, there are some other countries that, that are closer to the desert, like Niger, northern Nigeria, Chad, and so on. And talking about some issues of environmental activities and so on, mm -hmm. um, the issue is always like look at from the perspective of um, the desert itself mm -hmm. and some environmental mismanagement by the uh, communities of these nations. So, how do you think? Do you think that um, this um, nuclear um, burial? In the desert also exacerbated uh, the like, certification, severe drought, heat wave in some of these regions because nobody talk about that. We always talk about it as a result of the desert itself. So, to an extent, do you think there is some kind of punishment? Yeah, I mean, I can't come into this with sort of empirical evidence, and I think that there remain to, there are some studies that have, people have tried to do on sort of mapping radioactivity in the desert around these sites and how has it impacted. But I think that remains really to be done. But my strong sense from the, the people I've talked to, the activist organizations that I have a sense of, is that absolutely the, these bombs and the uranium mines, right, both as connected projects, have, I mean, the radioactivity has seeped into the groundwater, which travels throughout the desert, right? It has had tremendous ecological impact and certainly tremendous health impacts on people who are living with it. So I think, and it's certainly not contained to Algeria. I mean, it's, and there are even maps that the French military has that show, they're like isodose curves, just showing fallout, aerial fallout after the aerial bombs. And you can see that the fallout clearly landed on all of the states across the Sahara and the Sahel, right? And that's just like the, the skimming the surface, I think of the impact. So yes, I think there's an impact. The evidence that I have for that are these aesthetic works and people's sort of collected testimonies. 
Um, and I think a lot of work remains to be done in terms of sort of empirically. Yeah. Um, here and then here, maybe we'll have time for two more. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, I hope this question doesn't come too much out of left field, but I was. I was looking at the the photo you had earlier of the stars, mm -hmm. looking at trying to look at it from the perspective of um, you know Deepesh Chakrabarti's uh, recent work, mm -hmm. and the point he makes of the coincidence between geological, I guess in that case cosmological time and human yeah. time, yes. and that's that's one of the characteristics of the so-called Anthropocene, right? Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, what another, the way of reading that would be that what we're looking, you know, this idea that also informed. Uh, the the tests mm -hmm. right that okay this will be, will be buried in the desert nature takes its own time mm -hmm. but now human time like what we do as human beings is coincided mm -hmm. with planetary time right there's mm -hmm. no distinction I mean that that's what the end mm -hmm. and has altered mm -hmm. right I mean and, and our so it, it's instantaneous it's not as though we can say well let's wait you know thousands of years nature will do its work now we're doing nature's work and nature is doing our work right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I see me both the hands holding the, the rocks and, and, and this photo as a kind of mm -hmm. indelible reminder of, of, or an indelible image of that, mm -hmm. that coincidence and that. So I suppose I both agree and disagree with Jason's earlier point, mm -hmm. right? That it is about colonialism and it is beyond colonialism as well, mm -hmm. right? Because everybody is implicated now, yeah. right? So it, yeah. it is, I mean, climate injustice and everything else, but there's also sort of a, um, you know, a, a uh, a human planetary dimension to this that that really goes beyond you know the the specifics of, of imperial history not not to down you know downplay it at all but but to sort of somehow find a way to think about those two things together yeah Does that make sense? exactly that sort yeah. of uh, state-sponsored colonial projects have now sort of transcended those frameworks right. to become planetary and and maybe this is what we sort of I think Louis articulated a version of my, of my mm -hmm. question to you is yeah, but in some sense, it's sort of transcended the ways that we have for thinking about colonization right. and imperialism, and has become uh, sort of into yeah, the, 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 sort of the, the micro, and macro, macro or interrelated, yeah. and a, and the, like in that photograph, right, the hands themselves becoming mineral. But there's mm -hmm. this way in which we are part of the geological processes. Even the distinction between human and non is no longer mm -hmm. you know, no longer holds in the same way. Thank you for that. That's gonna it's a really helpful comment. Um, it was not out of left field, that's exactly <laughs> you're, you're getting. I think it was just maybe one more. We have or exactly one minute. One minute. So I'd love to hear. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. My name is Devine Nosby from the Department of French mm. and Italian. But I'm on the French side. <laughs> the Italians are there. <laughs> so I was, uh, uh, yeah, I re I'm very interested in the, the, the idea of uh, considering um, like visual narratives, mm. systemic narratives as a source of knowledge, uh, as, as alternative source of knowledge versus testimonial, factual, yeah. and so on and so on. Yeah. So uh, how do you deal with this? How, how would you consider it as being complementing? Uh, you know, what of course you have been sharing with us uh, as like uh, documents, factual documents mm -hmm. about uh, what is going on. And uh, yeah, so how, how would you deal with uh, you know aesthetic works? Are there any really alternative ways of, of reconciling with the past? Is it uh, about reconciliation? Is it about uh, um, uh, like uh, proposing another narrative that mm -hmm. is uh, you know um, like uh, complementary or uh, in contradiction with the ones that mm -hmm. are in factual? So how do you uh, you know kind of deal with both kind of domains? Yeah, that is such a great question that's at the heart of what I'm trying to do, but I think that I, I have been trying to learn from these works, like how to read them and how to think with them, because these are the only kinds of works that I have found that actually register these totally sort of uh, ghosted histories. Right? The other, like the archives don't help you think about what these images help to think about. So there's something about the sort of search for form in the projects and in the works themselves is like looking for a genre or looking for a frame that can precisely move beyond the sort of limited frameworks we have for thinking about colonial violence and, and I don't know, shift the frames, go beyond the visual um, to other senses, right? The sonic and the, the, the haptic in ways that, um, I don't know, I'm still thinking that through actually, but that's the heart of this project really, is what can these other forms do to help train imaginations and senses in different ways to perceive things that the frames we have don't 
help to make visible or knowable. Um, and I think aesthetic works are key to that. Um, so I'll keep writing about it. And these questions, thank you for your questions and such being such a, an attentive and interested audience. For an hour of your lunch break, you gotta go. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Jarvis, and thank you, Professor Dean, for thank inviting you. her. Thank you. Thanks so much for And if you all would like to continue the conversation about 